But anyway, I was I was lucky that I, I, I didn't miss it. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of floods that happened. Uh, I'll go a little bit on the Father's Day flood, and I'm going to talk about uh, how Fulton grew over the years that I was uh, city network working for the city, and a lot of the issues that we had with stormwater runoff. Um, so I'm going to start off with the, the first uh, thing, uh, a couple of the floods that happened. There was one that happened um, in the late 1800s where the um, Heron Dam broke. Uh, here in Dam was uh, Walmart. There was a uh, a dam in the holding area here that the mining company used. Uh, there's a number of mine shafts living along this area right here. Uh, that was their water supply right there. And I never even knew about this event. Like somebody walked in my office and said he lost three of his family members in that flood. Um, they had a house, and we, when I was talking, we couldn't figure out where the house was. It was somewhere down on the bottom here before the uh, creek went out to uh, Portage Lake. But, um, so that was the first flood. I don't know if that was a rain event or not, or the dam just collapsed. I think it was just an earthen dam that they had, and that may have uh, just collapsed on its own. Um, but it was the, the only one that I know where we had deaths. I think there was three deaths uh, on that one. Um, the second um, flood was in um, 1912. They had uh, there was a dam that was right up here that was called the Hubble Dam. Um, there was a farmer's field that was a pretty big farmer's field that was all up in this area that we found looking in the archives uh, right here. And that dam broke and uh, most of the water ran right down through here through Michigan Tech. Um, on my computer where um, Stephanie did you lock me out here oh there we go okay um sorry so this is down on the streetcar uh tracks um where this area flooded it was pretty much down around the campus area where it is right now uh, most of that water came right down uh between Park Street, i believe and when that dam broke, it just came right across 7th Avenue and came right in this area right here. So we did find an article on this. It was uh, the water seemed to recede within 24 hours. Um, but they did have, there was, it did mention in that article that there was a uh, trestle somewhere for the train. And they were worried about that trestle uh, caving in or falling over. So they parked the railroad car right on top of it. Oakley, hold it down and, and keep it in place. Um, when it's not working on here. Here's another uh, view of that street car that we found in the paper. This is the courthouse or not. So this would be probably somewhere between Franklin and Agate Street. Uh, it came up one block off of College Avenue and, and along Houghton Avenue and ended right about university when you turn down to the university into the campus right now on Hubble Street. Um, so that was the, the second flood. Uh, and that was a rain event where that dam failed. I grew up, uh, I grew up on Blanche Street right here. There was still a holding pond up here, and this is where we used to play when we were uh, up in this area. And then there was actually a bunch of mobile homes and things. Uh, after the war, the people that came to Michigan Tech would live up there. Uh, and then Tech is right just in the huge parking lot right now. So we'll talk about a little bit of the runoff, but that's, that event flooded this area here. And then again in 19, uh, let's see, I've got pictures here. Here's a streetcar track here. That Ran along, here's Franklin Street, came up one block, came along Jasper Street, came back in there. This was, they called Florence Avenue for a while, it's Houghton Avenue. Um, the highway kind of runs up through this area right here. It ended right at the Cracker Brothers, a store right there. Uh, in 
back then it was uh, ER uh, store, and it said the water completely flooded that store. And that was the most damage we talked about in the article. So this was a stream star track that, that ran to Houghton there. Here are some of the houses that it showed in, in the article. I think this is probably right around where College Avenue is. I think I recognize this house, but I do not recognize the rest of these houses here. Here's the plat of the area, and here you can see actually where the new highway is. And here's the old plat. And here was a pressure well right here. This is 1978, right after I started working for the city. Uh, we had another significant rain event. Most of the water that came from here, this rain event, a lot of it came all the way up from where the high school was, across here in Avenue, came down across um, through that Hubble Dam area and came right into this location here. We had a lot of issues um, over the years with water coming down Blanche Street and East Street and all those areas out there. If every time we had a major rain, we had a city crew out there for a day or two just picking up all the sand and everything that came down over the hill. So we had a lot of stormwater problems in that area uh, early on. Um, here's the flood damage that we had. The Father's Day flood was about three feet higher than what it was, but this is the low point out there. So, I mean, any, any water that's coming here, I don't think you can guarantee that this isn't going to happen again. Uh, at least, maybe not to this minute. But, uh, we almost have to block off that parking lot to, to do that. So, that was, you know, three of the, of the flood events we had, you know, being on the side of a hill, um, every time we had a major rain, there were different areas that were affected. Um, and we usually would spend one or two days out with the crew just trying to keep things cleaned up. Um, but we'll take you back now when, uh, on the development of Houghton and when I first got here. I was going to work one year for the city. I graduated from Michigan Tech and I pretty much wanted to get out of town. Houghton was still in a state of decline, although the university was growing. school, two or 3,000 when I, when I was there, but um, Houghton just fell way behind. I mean, we just, we were not keeping up with the times. Um, the town was really in difficult shape. When I started with the city, the one thing Ray Kester had just become city manager in uh, late 1972, and he wanted me to read the master plan for Houghton. And I grew up here, um, you know, I saw Houghton develop over my high school years and stuff, and really nothing was happening was going downhill. But he wanted me to read this master plan, and I went home and read it. It was actually a plan that was funded through HUD, and it was a plan for Houghton and Hancock. And I brought it back, and the next day, so what did you think? I said, well, first of all, I said, this talked about a regional shopping center on 126. I said, that's where the city dump is, and there was nothing else up there. I mean, Van Norton Hill, a little two-lane highway that came up there, and... Even Sharon Avenue was a two-track road at that time coming down to that area. Uh, we actually had two different dumps in that, that area. I said, I, I have a hard time believing that. Talked about the importance of the waterfront. I grew up here as a kid. I never went on the waterfront. We wanted to go somewhere. And we went to Sunshine Beach. It was right across from where the golf course is right now. There were so many timbers and things floating in the water and spikes, and, and it was just a mess. Uh, old warehouses, dilapidated buildings. Um, the railroad tracks are down there. There was beer bottles all over the place. It was just not something that was very sightly. And I just, you know, I, I could see that in a plan, but I said, how much money is it going to cost to fix this thing up? The third thing was um, the historic significance of the downtown. And downtown was doing very well at the time because there was really no other place to go. But in the 50s and the 60s, a lot of the people had covered up their storefronts, the nice sandstone and the historic stuff you see today, with other types of materials. Q111 plywood was over some of these places. I mean, it was, and I've got a lot of old slides from those days um, that I've shown it in, uh, before and after things, but the downtown was, it really looked, I mean, the signage and there was so much stuff hanging out, you couldn't even see anything uh, downtown. So it was really, it, it was, like I said, it was, it was a place that had a lot of potential, but this plan talked about the historic significance and bringing that back. And the last thing that it said, was that Michigan Tech's going to grow, we need to have places for people to build houses. And I don't think from the time from 1970 to 1974, we built one house in Holding. 
So the first thing we had to do was try to figure out, all right, where are we going to start developing some subdivisions and how are we going to get some development going in, in the city? Um, we had some areas up in this area right here that were platted. All this land was platted. But the people that owned the land were using it for their retirement, which could be many years away. Uh, they didn't want to pay for the water, the sewer, and the roads of one of those subdivisions. So we stepped in and we said, all right, what we're going to do is that we're going to pay. We're going to put the roads in. The city's going to pay for that. We're going to pay for the water and sewer. And at that time, we were able to go back in and reassess all these lots. And the tax taxes went up significantly. And we forced them to sell. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, houses started being built. Um, so these are some of the areas of, that we worked on first. Um, that were up on the hill. We um, we didn't do, back in those days, things were happening so fast that we really didn't do a lot of work on stormwater management. We pretty much found out where the existing uh, water was going, and as we paved the roads and shaped the roads, you know, we pretty much just left an opening in the curb and let it go in the, in the ditch areas and stuff like this. So we didn't spend a lot of time on doing that. We had this subdivision right here. I can remember we buried a bulldozer, and it went, Right, right up to the seat, it was so wet in there. Uh, so we had to haul mine rock in and, and try to get some of these subdivisions open. But it really was uh, uh, something that really started kind of a boom in Holton where all of a sudden people started building houses. We were up to, um, for most of my career, until about 2006 or seven, we were doing 10 to 15 houses a year. And so we had to keep trying to, to move out in areas that where we could have enough lots available for people to build. When I first came to the city, um, we didn't really have the infrastructure. We were, um, we didn't have enough water. We were, we were sharing the water line that came down from Adams Township for from Hancock. Uh, there were times when I first started working with the city that you could, you could look in our storage tanks and you could walk in there with a pair of boots. Um, there was hardly any water in those areas. So we ended up having to do an emergency well system and start pumping water in from the sands in the system. We got a grant to do a um, to do separate the water and sewer, the sewer. We had storm and sanitary all in one system, um, and we had a sewage treatment plant that was right across the canal, right where the rod is over here, that uh, treated most of the sewage. It, uh, anytime we had a rain or whatever, uh, I know that they got some treatment, but a lot of it just went right in the canal. When we got the grant, we wanted it, we wanted them to pay for a brand new sanitary sewer system. So we didn't think it was, why would we want to put a new storm sewer system in when the sanitary was in so bad shape? And a lot of the uh, roof drains downtown, a lot of the home perimeter drains are all hooked to that system. And plus the, the sanitary system was leaking so bad, we had so much groundwater infiltration into that. Um, it was just a mess, but we couldn't convince them. We said, no, you have to put in a new stormwater system. So about three or four years after we got our grant, they finally changed that around and said, all right, we'll go into communities and we'll put a new sanitary system in. Because we could have used that old system you know, for, for the stormwater. Um, so that was a major project. I mean, we, we, we did that throughout the town. Um, the, so that took away a lot of the, the fluid or the stormwater that was going to the sewage treatment plant. Um, so after we got through some subdivisions up here, I think we, we got up here, we did the Cedar Bluff uh, subdivision up here. This was a really kind of a wet area in the bottom here. I can remember really having a hard time getting a, a road in there. And then we started working our way out um, to, the, to the west. Here is the limits that when uh, the 70s, uh, what it is there, and I've got a zoning map, and I'll show you later how much we've expanded the, the city limits uh, out in these areas. A lot of what we did was in the township, we would we would somehow uh, purchase or do trade property or whatever, we get a 40 acre piece of property, and then we could annex it by resolution. So we just annexed it into the city, and then we started our development um, out in this area. The problem that happened was we started down here. And there's a great big retaining area right here. I think this is where the water came from for the Bosch Brewery. Um, Cause it was spring, spring house main. I mean, this is a, a really kind of a neat area here. But we started up here and 
as we started going up the hill, we ended up having to change a lot of the, the things that we did in here because we didn't anticipate the growth being as fast and, and we didn't own a lot of this proper anyway. So we didn't think we were gonna be able to grow in this area, but we did. So it caused a lot of problems in this area as all the water was coming down here. Um, when we get a subdivision, typically the drain commissioner at that time pretty much signed off on it with not a whole lot of studies or calculations or stuff of, of what was going on with the stormwater. Um, we ran into our first real uh, lawsuit when we built this subdivision, we did have a retaining pond here. Um, but again, as we expanded up in this area, this pond wasn't big enough to hold it. And this pond kind of emptied out to the west. And this property owner uh, came back after us and said, you know, you've got to make that holding pond, um, you know, um, hold the water. You can't give me any more water than I got before the subdivision started. So we ended up probably doubling the size of that holding pond uh, in that area there. So um, then we got in our commercial development all the way up through here and here in Creek. If you remember, um, the here in Creek, this was actually an old uh, area where they loaded some of the copper ingots and things, but it was really a swamp um, where the, the beach is right now. We'd probably never be able to do that today under the wetlands regulations and stuff, but um, we took a lot of the sand where you see the Kmart store is right now. All that sand came out of here and we made our beach down here. We actually had our first we wanted to move the beach in from, from out by the golf course because we wanted people to walk to it and we wanted people to be able to ride their bikes and stuff. So the first thought was to come down here and build a, a public beach right here. But it was a stamp sand area and the, the bottom was really mucky. And we did some studies on it and the council just said, you know, no, we don't want it to go there. So as we started our waterfront development, and we did a waterfront development plan in 1982, um, the one thing that really came out of this waterfront plan is we did one section of the dock right behind where the ambassador is. And the people just loved it. They said, you have to continue this. We've got to get this waterfront fixed up. Um, so that was really, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm at the time uh, for us to start developing it. We looked at this area for our, for our beach. So the Heron Creek actually came down here and then came out this way. So we ended up straightening it out and again, we filled all this area in with sand and developed our, our public park there. Um, interesting scenario here is the developer that owned all this land wanted to build a holiday inn down there. He, um, in our master plan, we said we want to make as much of the water from public as possible. He wanted us to put the road in behind the place and he's going to build his development out on the front there. We said that doesn't fit in with our plan. If you want to do it, you're going to have to put in your own water, sewer, and roads. We waited them out. He couldn't, that wasn't, he didn't have enough financing to do that. So I ended up selling it. So we ended up getting a grant to put the road right up against the waterfront. People said we never sell those lots behind that. So nobody's going to build down there. You know, look at it today. So another area that, that we were able to develop uh, along the waterfront. But this here in Crick, um, and they put the new road through here. Um, that allowed a lot of this development to start happening up here. Um, we had, I can remember one controversy we had at the Heron Creek when they put the road in, it was a huge culvert that goes right underneath here. They wanted us to light that culvert so the fish could come up. And we got into a real argument. We said, well, who's going to maintain the lights? And so the city's got to maintain the lights. So who's going to go down on the culvert and start changing lights? Um, so we went, you know, we found out that the creek was, was fairly polluted, or polluted at the time. The fish probably aren't going to go up there anymore. So we ended up uh, with no lights in that culvert there. Um, our city dump was right here. Um, where Wal probably the heart of it was right about where Walgreens is, worked its way up. I keep telling everybody, I said, the Walgreens piece of property probably sold for the most per square foot of any place in Marquette, except for paper and UP, except for maybe Marquette. They paid absolutely fortune for that. And it's on the top of a landfill. Um, I couldn't get them to build their autos over there. They said, why don't you build there? I said, it's a perfect place for you. I said, absolutely not. We're not doing that. But anyway, uh, we get back. Uh, Walmart came to town and wanted to develop up in this area. So that's when we started uh, taking away a wetlands issue uh, with Walmart. The city owned the property. And we couldn't really figure out what was going. We had about an acre and a half or so of wetlands up there. 
We couldn't figure out because the hearing uh, stream was down here and the wetlands is up here. So what the heck's feeding the wetlands? Well, it's a leak in the water line that goes over to Hancock and it's been leaking forever. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up having to mitigate that and we built the, the uh, wetlands down on the IRL or the sand down here to mitigate that for the first section of the Walmart property. Um, when Walmart came in to do the second phase, we needed, we also had some wetlands that we had to deal with. And that's when we took this area uh, where, where the Heron Dam was. And there was still a dam there, but it had been, uh, there was a big uh, area in it, a hole in it that the water just flowed right through it uh, with the stamps and uh, uh, dam. There was old cars up there. It was all kinds of junk up there. We had actually looked at making a recreation site up there too. Um, put the dam back in, in uh, place and make it a recreation site around there. Thank God we didn't do that. Um, but we, um, so that whole area was, was completely cleaned up uh, with the Walmart phase two of that project. Uh, Walmart put in a holding, holding pond uh, behind here and talking with our public works department, the Father's Day flood, uh, they don't think that even overflowed. I, I can't imagine it didn't, but there was no damage to that area at all um, after the flood. So, and then the other thing that kind of held pretty well, I think, and Alex Mayer, she could probably tell you more, but when the Chevy dealer came in, they had to do a lot of work uh, to retain their water on their site. And before that, though, all the water from the mall and everything came right down through the creek. I think Alex called it Shopping Park Creek. <laughs> all the shopping carts from the mall ended up there half the time. But, um, so this whole area is fed. There's a huge um, area up here that feeds this, this Heron Creek area. Um, also, what we had to do was when the Walmart Phase 2 came through here, we put the landfill here. We had a big, major argument with the uh, DNR at the time about closing the landfill. Uh, I got here in 74. The first thing the city manager, when he got here in 72, he said, we got to get this landfill that I got here. He said, this is crazy. And it's, it's leaching right down into the canal. I said, whoever authorized to put a landfill there, he said, that was just, we got to get out right away. Uh, um, but the way they wanted us to close the landfill was going to allow the leachate to continue to go in here in Creek. And we refused to do that. So thank God MDOT came by and said that, all right, we'll close it. We got to get this road up here. You guys are not, um, you know, you're, you haven't reached an agreement how this is going to do it. We'll do it the way the state wants to do it. And they built the road. Problem was when Walmart phase two came in, the DEQ at the time says, all right, now you got to put a, um, a leachate collection system all along that, that area uh, to capture that uh, affluent coming out of the landfill. I don't know how effective it was. I mean, you just kind of put some drain towel and, and did a lot of work in there. We pumped a heck of a lot of water out of there. Most of it was probably rainwater and, and stormwater, but um, when the flood came through, it took that system out of there again. So I'm not really sure what the future of that system, but that that cost the city probably $20,000 a year just to maintain that system uh, because of the way they wanted that plan for this. So, um, another area that we developed was on the IRL sands. We declared this as a super fun site. Um, and we said, well, wait a minute. Where, and it was kind of at the last minute when they're doing all the other stamp sand areas around, they came back to the city of Houghton and said, all right, we're including you with all the other super fun sites in the area. Well, we have a municipal water source here. Um, we had this, this subdivision that already kind of started back in the 60s, I believe. Um, with houses down there. So we did have a plan to put canals through this area and houses. And they said, all right, he says, we'll allow you to do that. Um, but you have to cover up all the stamps and there has to be deed restrictions that we can't expose the stamps in down there. So we, we ended up making a subdivision down here uh, with that. We had a plan where all the canals were, we had a lot of contractors in the area looking for fill at the time. And we said, you can take as much fill out of those areas that you want where the canals are and we were hoping that they would take a lot because we didn't have a lot of money to pay for that. They got down about, I don't know, six feet and all of a sudden we hit Cabo. And this was actually kind of a, um, before the stamp stand was poured on here, it was kind of a swampy area. So there's a lot of rock and everything else that the contractors pulled out on us. So we ended up having to take on that ourselves. Um, so that subdivision 
really was a financial burden for us. Um, well, we got it done, and we got it done in time. And it's, it's you know, we got quite a few really nice houses and some really nice lots down there. Um, so those are kind of the areas that we've expanded. We also had some houses here. We also bought some land from the Sioux Line Railroad. Uh, kind of came up for sale. We didn't quite have enough money to, to buy it, so we ended up having to sell some of the property. We sold the property to the Super 8 Motel, and we kept the waterfront. So we, the city actually owned that path that's out the front of there. Um, but we, just, we sold that to, to them, and then we ended up selling some housing sites. We just, it came up for sale. We decided we got to grab it, but we really weren't in any kind of financial position to to do that. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the history of, of the area and how we kind of developed. Um, we're not building a whole lot of houses anymore. We've had a lot of infill. You know, we found out probably uh, 2006, 2008, people wanted to live closer uh, to the university, closer to the downtown. Uh, the new millennials wanted to be able to walk and bike to work. Uh, so our housing, new housing thing really, uh, we went down to about one or two houses a year for a while. I think we're back up to three or four, but not a whole lot. Um, so I don't know what the city plan is, is once we get all this area built up or where they're going to go next, but they're going to have to start looking for, for areas that we could, uh, for, for more new construction. Um, I'll get back a little bit into the Father's Day flood now. Um, Here's here's all has expanded over the years. So you saw the map where where uh, right here. We, this is all now. Uh, most of this is city owned land up here. We've been trying for years to try to figure out how to develop that. Pretty much on rock. I think at one time I even had a example of course for some home sites around here. Just trying to get the, the sewer from this point on is going to be pretty much blasted. Um, so there's a big chunk of land to do something. Very, very expensive to develop. Um, we've done what we call for Public Act 425, where we actually share with the township um, properties where they get uh, their taxes and we get the balance. Um, so, this, this is a big 425 area that we've done. Uh, we did something up where the old Sears store was. We did some things around uh, this area in here. Um, you'll see a little island right here. This is still Portage Township that we have. Um, Codites. Um, I think that before the 60s or something, this was number one location. I think that was a next before when I was a kid. Um, I think that was part of the township. So part of the flood uh, that happened on, on Father's Day, um, I can remember when I got up in the morning and, and my wife had said something about you, said it's going. I said, well, I've lived through a lot of Rain events. There's no way Agus Street can be. I said, I just can't believe this. And then I went outside to my garage. And we have a rain gauge outside. And I asked her, So when did you empty the rain gauge last? This is yesterday. I said, You couldn't have. I said, It's overflowing. It's seven inches of water. I said, I don't, I, I just can't believe we got that much water. But I really think this failure started um, up in this area. Uh, there's a, a catch basin. And I think that had some significant cracks around it. I think once it got underneath that, that asphalt, it just it just took it all right out. Um, a lot of this water um, came from um, down 6th Street over by uh, Franklin Street and then down this way. We took, we go you look at what we, we changed about, I'm guessing about seven, eight years ago, a lot of this runoff from all this area. Area uh, and there's a pipe that comes back down to the lake. This this used to fail a lot, um, and I think if we hadn't done what we what we did before the flood of the storm, I think you might even take it off the lake. All this water that came up in this area used to cross right here and come all the way down this way. Now it goes all the way out to the peat sock. So we blocked that culvert that's come up out of here. You'll see the creek that runs right south of the uh, SDC. Uh, for the gymnasium and is right there, that open creek, and that runs right down to the ski trails and right out to the peep stop. 
We used to have a lot of flooding problems, Old Mill Road, that came out right across the railroad tracks here. Um, and we diverted most of that water out. So we don't have as much water coming under. I don't know how many times they had problems at Old Mill Road um, with that washing out. The, um, so yeah, so this was a big improvement as far as, you know, I can't imagine what would have happened in this area here if we had not done that. Uh, so that's a big area that was collecting water and funneling it right through here, into these areas. Um, so a lot of the areas that I already thought, when I first heard that Angus Street was gone, I started looking at this oh, that place down by the Arrow Sand, there's somebody somebody's gonna lose a house down there. We didn't have any problems. I mean, the trail got washed out a little bit. Um, very little problems there. I thought D Stadium, we've had problems with D Stadium before, you know, low that's going to be two feet of water in the stadium. We have very little, little water in the stadium or any damage there. Um, the strip wall that's up right next to Walmart with a great big huge retaining wall. We've had some failures in that wall before. That didn't get touched. Uh, just areas that I really thought were going to really take a blow um, didn't, but other areas that I didn't expect it to, to do damage. It was unbelievable. Here's a, on the corner of six. Not really too much involved in this floor. I think this was part of the culprit. Once that failed, then we were we were toast. And it was interesting that it went all the way down Agate and didn't go across College Avenue. And I can remember times that uh, College Avenue uh, kids I don't see boogie boards or whatever. We have so much water that he take those boards and he'd run down College Avenue, stand on them, and slide down the road and and. Many times the college avenue was completely flooded, but none of the debris here, it all stopped at the bottom of the hill, which I, it was just, I couldn't do. Uh, now, right in this area here, all that debris stopped. The sand made a dam. Yeah, it just kind of came up. You're right now, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Dodge Street that, that went out uh, right at the bottom here. Um, again, the water just coming from the top of the hill all the way to the bottom. This area with, with the here, here in Creek, I, I couldn't believe it. I just cannot believe how much water came down through that place. It, uh, and the damage that it did was just unbelievable. Um, yeah, these, these are things that, uh, you know, how do you plan for something like this and, and what do you do in the future? I mean, some big questions that, that are out there. Well, that's kind of the end of my talk. Um, I'm open to any questions, comments, or if not John Sullivan was he, he probably knew a little bit more about some of these things that he was an engineer for EP engineering that do a lot of the stormwater uh, system that we had. And um, so there's been a lot of a lot of changes. You know, any development now we they have a stormwater ordinance. It took us a long time to do that stormwater ordinance. A lot to it. Um, how do you handle places in the downtown with an ordinance versus up on M26? There's a huge amount of difference in, in the kind of runoffs and problems that you have. Um, they had talked last week about uh, AutoZone has got a system of, um, I think there's six or eight foot culverts underneath that whole park of that retains their water uh, in there. Um, a lot of things that we, even on M26, that grew so fast that it seems like we got about halfway through the construction uh, while the stores up there and we said, you know what? This looks like anywhere USA. You know, we really didn't ha take the time to really try to plan out the landscaping and stuff. Now, now everybody that has to build up there now has to go through a whole different set of rules as far as landscaping and uh, curb planning areas in the, in the uh, parking lots and all that stuff. But it just, there were so many things going on. Um, we had so many grants, um, so many things that were happening back in those days. It was really hard to keep up what we were doing. Yes. Uh, so, can you give us a story since you've watched this, watch not only the town evolve, but also probably the way things were regulated evolve? How much of the sort of a decision making you made about stormwater planning was internally driven by, well, we need to keep up with the times, versus how much of it is was like the state or the federal government saying, you have to have these, for stormwater management, these are the things you have to do. Can you sort of handle on how that worked? Yeah. How it was in the beginning versus the end of the change of the I think until maybe 15 years ago or so, it was pretty much through the drain commissioner. And we didn't, like I said, we had plots that were approved fairly quickly without any kind of a 
uh, major stormwater plan. Um, you know, it was one of those things that you built it and if you found out where the water started running and, and you know, you changed things and changed the pipe size and, and the things that you had to do, but it was kind of, it's a mess a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, but we didn't have a whole lot of money back in those days. I mean, that was the, the uh, um, you know, we were running, there was times that I didn't think we were gonna make payroll a lot of times. We were just right on the edge of, but we had so many, projects going on and we so much of our money for match money and things um that it was just incredible um i'll tell you starting the, the parking they have two parking decks downtown right by the old uh, where the bank is you know we we put a grant in for one parking deck by um by the bank there we went into to hud and eda well i'd funded the, the the parking deck about two weeks later eda came back and says how many parking decks you got there so why? Well, so we're funding one. <laughs> we invented another parking deck or by UP Engineering because we had a long range plan to do that, but it was just like, well, <laughs> we got one for two of them. But we ended up bumping the village up for two years because we had that really put us in the hole. There was there was sixty thousand dollars of debt that we had come up with. It was just like, but it was we. Uh, I admit, I mean, we did a lot of things by the seat of our pants. I mean, it was just things were just happening so fast, yeah. and there were so many grant dollars and things out there. I mean, even in the waterfront, I mean, every year we just. They just, we kept getting grant after grant after grant. And people like, they saw, they like what they saw. What we did with all of our grants pretty much is we went down to Lansing or to EDA or whoever it was. We said, here's our project. Here's what you want to do. We did the same thing. We built the, the parking deck. And we said, what do you like and what do you don't like about the project? And if they didn't like something, we took it out. You know, and we made sure we got it done in time. We made sure they were a partner. And we just kept going through that. An interesting story in the parking deck was, we were told the EDA always likes to cut something out of the parking deck. So we put the covered streets in. They loved them. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you a million stories of things that, that just, you know, are all crazy. <laughs> we try to second guess somebody and, and uh, but like I said, it was a, it was a, it was a heck of a run that, that while we were there. And like I said, things just were happening so fast. It was just unbelievable. Um, the city was incorporated or became a city in 72. Yes. Right? So this is all your, the time span you're talking about is right when there was an opportunity for development because before that it was all there was no staff, there was no right. Dancing, right? Yeah. Yeah. We went from, and I think, uh, I think we were close to 9,000 students. We had kids living in basements. We had kids living in attics. We, I mean, that was unbelievable. I mean, and the, the apartment boom was was crazy from 75 to 83. I mean, people were building apartments like crazy. There's a lot of buildings that were built. They, they threw them as fast as they could. A lot of them had electric heat in them, and, and it was crazy. But all of a sudden, Michigan Tech announced that they are going to reduce their enrollment. And I think the last apartment house was built in 84, and nothing happened until Stevie Kinnan did the one at the College Motel. And that was in 2000, I don't know, five, six, seven, whatever. I mean, there was no multiple family residence built in home. We, I think we might have done a couple of low income ones, but just, just the bottom, just all of a sudden we went home. Oh, you know, what's going on? And the rents pretty much stayed the same until about six or seven years ago. And the rents all of a sudden started climbing up. And now you see some more development going on. But, uh, housing is a huge issue with the city. I mean, we've got a lot of young professionals, a lot of people that want to move here, and finding affordable housing is is difficult. Um, the Houghton Hancock area, it's you know the housing market is very very good. Um, I do a lot of work with with Cali, Matt, some of the outlying cities right now. We're really trying to get those communities to kind of step up to the plate and and do some blight ordinances and enforce the blight and. and because people will live up there. I mean, just it's the housing is very reasonable and it's not that far away, but they got to start working on their Blake situation, and that's happening. It's gonna happen. So, any other comments or questions? Or, yes, Scott, the uh, since the city has that stormwater ordinance and all the development that's been built in that, yeah, um, Eric Warren told me that, and I think you repeated it, that everything performed well with the through the Bible State Plan. But there's a lot of the infrastructure and the development in the community that precedes that. Right? Yep. So based on your experience and then with the Crowder State Flood, are there vulnerabilities or, or obvious shortcomings in the infrastructure for the established development that's going to need attention? 
And if so, how would that get paid for? It's pretty difficult to go back on someone and, and tell them that now you've got to do stormwater retention or they really didn't have to do it before. We've tried for years and years to get the, uh, while the building's in the downtown, the roof drains and things off of our sanitary system. Uh, there's a huge lot of infiltration that comes out of the downtown uh, by doing that. But it's, you know, who pays for that? You know, the building order is going to, you know, I'm not going to get a return on my investment if I have to spend, you know, $100,000 trying to separate out the roof drains. And so issues like that are, are, are very difficult. Um, in a lot of cases, sometimes, like even the Chevy dealership, I mean, they had to do a lot of extra stuff there that, you know, maybe the mall or something should have had to do some some things. I mean, they, they had a, quite an issue that they had to deal with, but it was, a lot of it was somebody else's problem. Did the city form one of those drainage districts and have some kind of assessment so everyone chips in? You could, you could do a special uh, assessment district. Now Marquette, I believe, has, um, and there's some other communities around <laughs> that, that have a stormwater management uh, fee. So depending on how big of a parking lot you have that's hard surface, you pay so much a year for stormwater management. Um, one of the issues that came out is, is uh, there's been a lot of grants that have come out now with um, asset management for, for the storm and water, the saw grants. And in some of those cases that, depending on how you did your application, you have to fund the stormwater management. And that's a tricky thing. I mean, all of a sudden you go back to merchants and say, all right, you're gonna start paying you know, 50 or 100 bucks a month to, for us to manage the, the stormwater that comes off your property. Those are pretty popular things to, to deal with. So, I, you know, it's, it's you know, we had, we had issues at the Heron Creek uh, down at the bottom of the hill here. You know, that washed out by the Kessler Park, I don't know how many times. We were always fixing that. And we always kept thinking, you know, we got to go to Mine Rock. We got to go to sheet piling. We got to go to all the stuff that he and our came in and our DEP finances got used what is a core log. It looks like a, a log but it's made of, of some kind of a planting material. And you pile these on top of each other. I mean, two guys can lift them. They're very flexible. And you plant all your plants in there. You stake them together. And once they get grown, that'll hold. That didn't, they, they held through this flood. I could not believe it. We tried everything. And, and just sometimes the, the simplest things work. And you see a lot of things where people are building holding ponds with, with grass areas, and that filters the, the water. And, and uh, we've done a lot of... Uh, work when I was working for the city with uh, senior design projects and they would design a building or whatever and a lot of times they would take uh, the holding pond outside and they would reuse some of that water for like the toilet or the sprinkler system or uh, the lawn watering system and they really had some really neat management ideas for that water but as you look back now when somebody came into the city with a building permit to do you know, I'll say Pizza Hut came in, you know, we probably turned that around and I would say in less than a week, that building permit. Nowadays, it would probably be two or three months um, before they could get a permit. And the, the even the calculations for the stormwater management, I'm, I've never really been involved in that, but, you know, you're paying an engineer to come up with all the calculations and stuff. So it's it's a lot more money to, to develop, but in the long run, I mean, it saves. But like I said, I, I don't know how you you go forward because we've had probably my guess we've had two or three hundred year events in the last 10 years. Is that right? I don't know. I mean, it just seems like we've had some unbelievable storms like I've never you know seen before. And then all of a sudden we get this one. That's just way beyond anything you could ever dream of. Yes. Given the unpredictability of where the water went, do you think it's beneficial to do more dispersed, but you know, quite a few smaller scale infiltration basins, just wherever there's land available, kind of you know, artificial but naturally influenced wetland. Yeah, I think a lot of those ideas are, are, are great. The problem is when you get in the old parts of Houghton, you know, you got you're dealing with rock, you're dealing with some very steep hills, you have hardly any property that's available. Um, you know, I don't know where you'd do something on Agate Street. Um, a lot of these streets that we have your problems with, I don't know where you'd retain that, that water. Uh, you need some awful big retention areas to, to do that. So it's, you know, it's all a matter of, of how you want your, your tax dollars spent. There's only so much to go around. And 
Yeah, it's tough. Can't just run the water down the yeah. <laughs> I always wonder, there's a mine shaft up by the public works garage. I said, why can't we open that and just dump all the snow in there? Why, why should we be dumping snow up there and taking a bulldozer and pushing it around and then having a site that we had to maintain and everything else? This is dumping down the mine shaft. Why not? First guy that backs a truck up would probably end up in a mine shaft. Might <laughs> <laughs> another, another good idea gone bad quick. <laughs> Yes. Say, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm a student at Michigan Tech working on my thesis of uh, ethnography disasters. Um, if any of you want to uh, talk to me after this, I'm um, trying to collect eyewitness accounts and uh, kind of do the whole experience of the Father's State flood from the uh, event itself to the response by FEMA and the community. Thank you for your time. Yeah. It was amazing that, that, you know, you had people that had four feet of water in their basement and the person next door didn't have anything. You know, it just, uh, Things happen that I just I can't believe, and I think we have. You know, I my first house was out in, in West Houghton, and it had a perimeter drain around around the basement. And I don't know how many times I would get a call. Somebody would say, "Well, I've never had water in my basement before. Now I got water. You got a water leak out there." And I, I think the groundwater just just finds different channels, and we'd be out there doing all kinds of testing and everything else for our water system, and we could never find a leak. And, and you know, there's there's a a lot of movement of that water underneath there and, and how you predict where it's going and what to come. But that was a, always a tough one. Somebody says, you know, I've lived here 25 years. I've never had water in my basement. It's got to be the city's fault, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes? I don't advocate building dams, but here in dam, if there was some way that you could build a dam but leave it open so it could act as a great big giant sediment trap, you probably wouldn't have the problem you had down here in Chris. You could have done something. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that's reasonable or not. There's a there's a there's a gate up there now. You know, we we, we took the dam out, and there's a, there's a flood control gate that's in that wetlands area that's there now. You know, how much of that sediment you know came over that that gate or whatever? You know, I don't know. Um, and I don't know how much more of a dam you'd have to build, or what kind of a structure you'd have to do to hold the sediment back, but then still allow the water to come through. I mean, it's, I think it's a good idea, but it's just it's. Uh, you get that much water coming through there. I don't. It's gonna find. It's gonna go where it wants to go, and you know, take it out. So, yes. Yeah. Didn't they enlarge those culverts under Sharon? Where on Sharon? Under Sharon. Oh, the new ones. Yeah. I don't. know, You have to ask somebody from the city. I don't think they enlarged them by much, though. Did they? I think they only did as well. Okay. He found some culverts very quickly and was able to get yeah. that replaced. It was nothing. He found something that was laying around somewhere to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're going to want to go to a, a box culvert or something. Or in there. That, I think, and I don't know, I think a lot of that stuff is being determined with the DEQ and them right now. You know, if you look at where it washed out behind uh, Spira Rental, uh, that area is still open where that dam was right there. Uh, we had some issues with that before, um, and we put a, a, a secondary way for the water to get out of there. We had a number of proposals for that, and uh, kind of got shot down in, in, on those proposals because we knew that was was a vulnerable area, and we were worried about it it overflowing. But it seemed like the, the cross connection that we made to the Pilgrim worked very well. I mean, even some of the, the spring, high spring up front us, we had it held very well, but. Obviously, you get that much water coming down through here. And again, we're putting more water from all the way up from the high school all the way down to Peeps Up. Yeah. Uh, problem with that area right there is the, you know, the, the culvert that's going underneath the highway is small. So, right. you know, there's, there's going to have to be something that's. They talked about putting a bridge in there. Well, then now you got free flowing water running right right to the road, and any kind of a major runoff, you're going to lose the road. So, a lot of issues, and I think there's a lot of discussion going on. You know figure out what's what's the proper size and what what do you do and anything else I appreciate everybody coming if you have any questions I'll be around for a little while and um, I appreciate it <laughs>